Welcome to the Mike White Podcast, where I, Mike White, share my conversations and book reviews through my journey to learn all that goes on in this amazing world. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. All right, welcome to the Mike White Podcast. This week, I have retired game developer, John W. Ratcliffe. How's it going, John? Doing well, thanks. Well, thanks so much for coming on. I, I found you on Twitter, and the reason I found you, I'll, I'll share the screen here so everyone can see it, is uh, I was I was on Bitcoin Twitter, as we like to call it, and Unchained had this really cool chart of, it kind of showed how long people have been hold, holding their Bitcoin uh, throughout the years, and they attributed it to here to John. So I I wanted to get down to the bottom of it and figure out how you decided to, how you made this and and why you decided to make this. Uh, Well, really Unchained made that. So I had done some, some work which preceded it and they came up with the idea to present it in this uh, particular graph format. Um, So that was their, their innovation. Uh, There was also a a difference between what they did and what I did. that I don't even know if it's necessarily that significant, but it seemed important to me at the time. And it is um, what their graph is doing is they're looking at only unspent transaction outputs, okay, UTXOs. Um, mm-hmm. And that's very useful and very informative. Uh, but what I was, when I was working on this, what I was interested in is identifying uh, which Bitcoin are lost forever. Like they're gone. Somebody huh. threw their hard drive into the trash and they're never coming back or not. Um, And there's an observation there, which is, and things have changed over time, but as you know, if you have a Bitcoin wallet, a single Bitcoin wallet can have hundreds or thousands of UTXOs. Um, And then back in the old days, before we had this, uh, the the, the new way wallets are set up, back in the old days, people would have one Bitcoin address and it was like their account number and they would reuse that address over and over and over again. Um, that's less common today, but in the early days of Bitcoin, that's how it worked. So the point is, is that a single Bitcoin address could be associated with potentially a thousand UTXOs. If someone has a thousand UTXOs, if they spend even a single Satoshi, what that means is all of those UTXOs are now considered alive. And this chart mm-hmm. does not reflect that. This chart is looking at only individual UTXOs. So if some whale owns enormous amounts, this, the way uh, uh, Jane has done this, it doesn't reflect that. That said, I'm not certain that it's, at the end of the day, I'm not certain how important that is. And especially now, everybody does address, room. They, they use these uh, wallets where every transaction, they get a whole new address. So it's less of an issue. I think the data is valid either way, uh, but regardless, Early in my career, I did a statistical analysis. I, was, I did cardiovascular research at a hospital. And a part of that job is when you have to do uh, statistics. And I literally never took a college course in statistics in my life. <laughs> so because I was in the, in the university, I was able to meet with a statistics professor who I consulted with. And they gave me advice about how to do this, and we published papers. So while I am not a statistics expert, I do understand the power of statistics. And with, with certain statistical methods, you can make predictions. So we, at the end of the day, for any given UTXO, there is no way to know if it's truly, you know, represents somebody lost their hard drive in the trash, or the person just, they're just not touching it. Like, Mm -hmm. ultimately, you cannot answer that question, but on a statistical basis, you can, okay? Because there are trends over time. So we can see year in and year out as the price of Bitcoin goes up and down, as there's incentives, right? Imagine that you owned a thousand Bitcoin many, many, many years ago. Um, There's a lot of reasons you would want to sell some of it or move some of it, even if you didn't want to sell it. Let's assume that you're the ultimate holder and you got thousands of Bitcoin for 10 cents, okay? And you're the ultimate holder in the world. You're not going to sell it. You still are incentivized to move your Bitcoin to a new wallet for security reasons. So the idea that someone had a thousand Bitcoin 10 years ago 
and has never in a, in 10 years so much as even moved them to a new wallet, that's, I would think that's unlikely. There's enormous uh, financial and social reasons that you would want to move your Bitcoin. So there's all this Bitcoin from a very long time ago when Bitcoin was not worth hardly anything um, that we want to know what's, what's happening with it, um, how much of it is there. And what I was doing at the time, this is around 2015, is I was looking for statistical trends over time. And what I, the last time I ran this analysis, what I was seeing is the number of time that really, really old uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin from 10, 11 years ago, the frequency with which that happens is mind-bogglingly rare. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, uh, you know, uh, every day there's uh, 50 of them. No, it was like a month could go by and not a single UTXO that was 10 years old has been touched. And that was in 2015. That's eight years ago. So I, what I want to do is is redo that analysis. I uh, apologize for all the, the, the beeping there. Um, you get it. Uh, let me close that out. Um, and then get back. Okay, I've made things worse. <laughs> all right, I should have taken care of that. I have a lot of tabs up open. Sorry, let me get back to where no, I was. So the analysis, the, the analysis today, I believe we can show statistically over time that um, we can find correlations. When the price of Bitcoin goes way up, people would be motivated to want to move some of their Bitcoin, etc. So what we can show is that over time, these Bitcoin are gone. They are never coming back to life. Whoever had them, they've lost those keys a long time ago. And it's an it's important thing to know because it's a lot of Bitcoin. Everybody goes, oh, there's 21 million Bitcoin. Well, actually, no, there's not 21 million Bitcoin. Anybody who lost their private key, those Bitcoin are lost forever. They will never come back. So how many Bitcoin are there really? If it's not 21 million, is it 19 million? Is it 18 million? Um, and then that's always fascinated me. And that's a big part of my motivation for doing this research is just to identify how many Bitcoin are lost forever. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other is just trends, which is where Unchained Capital focused is, how are he, people who are holding over time? Like when the price crashes, do a bunch of people freak out, sell all their Bitcoin, et cetera. Um, it's important to note that when you do, this is what's being, this is all happening on what's called on-chain analysis. So every, the entire Bitcoin blockchain is completely public and anybody can inspect it, you can look at it, you can analyze it. The problem is um, because all that data is there, you, you, it's very easy to draw conclusions that are not supported because um, the reality is there, are, I don't know the exact number, I, I've heard various numbers of how many people in the United States of America or worldwide own Bitcoin, like you say, do you own Bitcoin? You know, I think it's, I don't know the exact number, it's probably over 10 million people that if you said, do you own Bitcoin, they'd say, I own Bitcoin. Let me tell you, 10 million people do not control their own private keys. The yeah. number of people who actually control their own private keys is probably not more than, it's, it's tens of thousands, if that. It's not millions of people. So all those millions of people who say they own Bitcoin, if they don't control their own private keys and they say they own Bitcoin, what they really mean is their Bitcoin sitting on Coinbase or, or, or some other custodial system. So when you do yeah. on-chain analysis, you are not seeing what's happening with those millions of people. Okay, All of their transactions are happening on Coinbase or on Binance or on whatever. None of, those show, none of that activity shows up on-chain. Uh, additionally, people who are using the Lightning Network, none of those transactions so, show up on chain. So we can infer things from looking at on chain, but you have to be careful and cautious about what you say because you can only you, you don't want to extrapolate beyond what the data set shows. That said, you can still learn a lot. And in fact, one of the things that's kind of interesting is those big custodial guys, those uh, the Coinbases of the world and the MSTRs, 
I mean, these people are holding 100,000 and 200,000 Bitcoin. Uh, those are going to stick out like a sore thumb on chain. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Those they've got those Bitcoins stored. They're stored on chain somewhere, and they will stick out like a sore thumb. So, uh, just mining the Bitcoin blockchain for data is interesting. I don't consider myself a, a data scientist per se, but it is interesting. Uh, and as a personal hobby project, that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, is I'm uh, trying to regather all of this data uh, relative. Uh, to the current time, uh, and unfortunately, that the ever since SegWit and some other changes, the format of the Bitcoin blockchain has changed quite a bit. So I have to rewrite my software to support uh. all the latest changes, uh, which is kind of frustrating. Also, the blockchain has gotten huge. I mean, it's insane how big it is. When I wrote this analysis code years ago, I think the entire blockchain is like fifty gigabytes or something. It's taking up half a terabyte on my hard drive. So wow. to do this kind of analysis, um, I'm trying to do it in such a way that it doesn't like take three months for my computer to do the analysis and give me the answer. So I, I it just analyzing all of that. Um, and one of the things I'm definitely thinking about doing, I'm going to do is there are only um, 21 million Bitcoin, as we know, in total um, that if you looked at, say, a 4K image, do you know how many pixels are in a 4K image? It's a lot. Uh, I don't uh, have the number in front of me. More than... it's, a lot, it's a lot more than 21 million, right? Oh, so wow. if you... Well, well, let me see here. Calculator. Uh, uh, four... Is it... It's not 4,000 by something, is it? It's is, 4, is 4K square. just totally arbitrary? It's uh, 16 million. So there's 16 million okay. pixels in a 4K image, all right? So there's only 21 million Bitcoin, right? So if you if you think of it as each Bitcoin um, took up one pixel, well, obviously a single Bitcoin is just one little tiny dot, right? Your eye wouldn't even be able to see that one little dot. But let me tell you, MSTRs, hundred and whatever thousand Bitcoin, it's going to be a like a big a big block of pixels corresponding to that. So my idea is to take every single Bitcoin in existence and map it to an image color coded by age so the oldest bitcoins are purple right and the newest bitcoins are hot red right it's a normal spectrum where you go from cold to hot and i'm sure the unchained thing color codes similarly right mm -hmm. and they would also be fixed so say mstr has 100,000 bitcoin and that takes up you know 100,000 pixels on the screen once they get assigned on the screen they never move so what your eye is going to be drawn to is your eye is going to see this block of colored pixels. And I'm going to animate this thing on a daily, potentially on a block by block basis. So imagine an animation and your eyes are literally seeing every Bitcoin in existence. Okay, you see them with your eye. And as this animation plays out, as Bitcoin moves around, say Binance decides to reorganize their entire thing, your eyes would actually see all those Bitcoins move on screen. Um, so ultimately, that's my goal is to create an, an interactive or not interactive, but a visualization of the blockchain where you can actually see it because we all know what the blockchain is, but to see it with your eyes. And of course, I'll experiment with different visualization uh, approaches beyond that. But I just think that basic visualization will be really interesting. And what you're really going to notice with this visualization is you're going to see all these ancient Bitcoin that, that were from 2009, 2010, 2011. What will happen is this thing is going to be very dynamic, right? All the, all the Bitcoin that's traded on exchanges and happens daily will daily. be very, very dynamic. Okay, that's going to be in the red hot, hot, hot zone because that was, you know, that happened yesterday, right? Well, the stuff mm -hmm. that happened 10 years ago will sit way off to the side in this image in a cold, cold purple color because no one's ever touched them. And it'll give you a very direct sensory uh, a realization of, holy crap, look at all those Bitcoin. No one's touching. No one's moving. Uh, and ultimately, us holders, the us people, like I've lived through this. Everybody it seems like who gets into Bitcoin goes through the experience. I, it's just the way the price action has been. 
Uh, but you know, people go, oh, it's easy to hold when you've got your Bitcoin for a dollar. Well, no, it's not. I mean, people <laughs> bought their Bitcoin for 20 cents, and you can go back on the forums and go, oh, Bitcoin crashed to a penny. I lost all my money. I mean, it's all relative. Like, And yep. so even if you got your Bitcoin cheap a really long time ago, well, they're worth a lot of money now. All right. So if if one day you own $3 million worth of Bitcoin, and then a week later, it dropped from three million down to eight hundred thousand. You're like, on the one hand, oh, I still got eight hundred grand, but I don't think anybody watches an asset drop from three billion down to half a million. I mean, we have seen eighty-five percent, ninety percent drops in the price of Bitcoin, and if you have not lived through that, where you had a large amount of your net worth, just it's it's quite something to go through. And us holders, this, these guys who are like, if it goes to zero, I don't care. And that's people like me and other people like me. You see Same. it reflected in these charts because those are the people where they're, they will hold forever. And when, you know, every all this sort of freak out when the price goes up or price goes down, the long-term holders, the guys who are like, I'm here forever, they are rock solid. And there's a core of us. And you'll see it visually when I make this visualization. You'll see it with your own eyes. Uh, but we're what keep we're what keep it going. We're all willing to go down on the ship. And it's everybody goes seems to go through it because you know you you buy Bitcoin and and you know if you happen to buy it during a bull market, the price is going up and you're happy and you're in it. It doesn't matter how much money you put into Bitcoin. It's your money. It's important to you, right? Like if you have a thousand dollars, you put a thousand dollars into Bitcoin and a thousand dollars is like all the money you have in the world. That means a lot to you. And yeah. and watching it go down to 50 bucks from a thousand is, is hard to swallow. So I don't know. I, I still find it kind of, it's a really neat that we can infer so much from that data and um, I don't know. So it's a hobby project. Uh, my ultimate goal with the project is um, once I finish it and I've produced some, I'm actually going to hire a statistics consultant because, as I said, I'm not a statistician, but I'm going to hire a statistician uh, to work with me. And I could, you know, also leverage against ChatGPT because, you know, there you go. There's a free statistician for you. <laughs> but I want to look at the data in different ways look at it from this angle and look at it from that angle and see what we can infer from it and ultimately my goal is i hope i find some interesting stuff and that i can present in an interesting way and i'd like to go to you know conferences and have a formal presentation where i can educate the public about about these trends and and see what we can learn from it because i still think data mining the bitcoin blockchain there's a lot you can still learn from that that's super, it's super fascinating. This the whole, all the data, like you said, you can get from the ledger and just, I mean, what you're, you're explaining, I can picture like, I picture mempool.space and how that helped me kind of understand how miners mine and how the whole blockchain worked. But seeing that with this chart and, and your, your thought of the activity on, on chain would be really cool. Uh, do you have a prediction on how many Bitcoin have been, are lost forever? Yeah, I don't have the number in front of me. I used to know, and it hasn't really changed that much. Nothing's really changed even from back then. I think it was like 1.9 million Bitcoin or so, but I don't I don't quote me on that because I don't have the number in front of me. But it's it's on that order, right? Like there's there's a core about 1.8, 1.9 million, I think, Bitcoin from 2009, 2010. So Satoshi himself mind like i don't know over a million bitcoin he never touched any of them like none of them and and you can see them they're in the blockchain they stick out like a sore thumb a newly mined block you know appears mm -hmm. when you, there's a newly mined block it appears it's created you know we know if anyone has ever touched it and we know that for the first year or whatever satoshi was pretty much the only person mining them um, people who were not Satoshi, who actually kept their keys, they spent them. They all became multi-multi-millionaires. They'd be an idiot not to spend them, right? Satoshi never spent his. None of them. He did one test transaction to Hal Finney on block number 170. But 
you know, we can't say for sure which blocks are Satoshi's or which aren't, but for the first nine months or so of Bitcoin, almost all of them were his. And they've never been touched. No one's ever touched them. And I think after 13 years, it's safe to say they're never going to be touched. If they haven't been touched by now, you know, is there some rare possibility that somebody has those keys? I, it seems unlikely to me. Um, and all we can say is, like I said, I'll talk to a statistician because I don't want to make predictions that are not justified by the math, but there are clear trends here. And uh, like I said, it, it used to be when the price of Bitcoin would go way up, you would see these really old Bitcoin from 2010 and 2011, people would move them. I mean, they just, boom, they just got really rich. So of course they're gonna, they're gonna touch them. That began to stop happening, is, was the trend I was seeing, is that began to just stop happening to the point where you could go a month or two months and virtually, and that was in 2015, it's 2023 now. I think yeah. that, the, the number of times Bitcoin from 2009, 10, and 11 move, I think, is an incredibly rare event. Who's, who's got a private key from 13 years ago that never touched them once? And you were talking about like the security issues of that as well as people are incentivized to move their Bitcoin. Just... Highly incentivized, right. And would you say that because of not wanting to keep all your eggs in one basket or just like with changes in, with uh, like, cold wallet devices that's that exactly there might be it. attack that's exactly vectors. the cold storage device so back in the early days of bitcoin um uh early days of bitcoin the only way people managed their bitcoin was using the bitcoin core app which was extraordinarily non-user friendly and it it it, it was it was not very very user friendly and um you, it it would like randomly generate keys for you. You like clicked a button and said, I want a new key. And it was very weird and awkward. And um, it was very uns ins unsecure relative to the, you know, the current best practices. So if I were a guy, so oh, look, what do I mean? So I'm, I am a guy. So I bought my first, I got my first Bitcoin in 2012. A uh, buddy wow. of mine gave it to me. I didn't buy it. A friend of mine gave it to me. And um, that give, just give you a frame of reference where I started in Bitcoin. I have personally moved my Bitcoin over a dozen times over the years. First, I was like, oh, I'm going to move them to a paper wallet. And then people thought paper wallets are bad. So then I moved them to a different system. And then I moved it. And now I'm using a hardware wallet. So I personally have moved my Bitcoin for security reasons multiple times. Um, and if I had Bitcoin from 10 years ago, I'd want to move it over to to something more secure than the way it was before. So um, that that's just my thought. Wow, that is that is awesome. So you definitely have a lot of technical uh, expertise. And I want to want to dive into your story about how you got to this point of being a, a super coder. Uh, so I was wondering what your what your childhood was like, like, where'd you grow up? Well, actually, before I go to that, I'll go ahead and finish the story of, of, I think it's probably worth best saying how I got into Bitcoin would be. Yeah. So what happened was I'm a video game developer. That's been my career. And I think around 2012, I heard about Bitcoin. I looked at it for like 10 seconds and I'm like, this is just World of Warcraft money. I, I, and at first glance, I don't think I can be blamed for thinking that. So I was already familiar with digital money. That was... That was the business I worked in. I worked in massively multiplayer online games. All of them have, you know, the equivalent of World of Warcraft gold or, you know, currency units that you get. I mean, all of those MMOs have that. So when I first took a super quick glance at Bitcoin, I'm just like, this is just a made up game money and people are playing with. And I, that was it. And I was, I was done with it. And that's, you know, you know, wish I'd have spent more time looking at it. Because I could have bought it for, you know, 10 cents a piece at the time. Wow. So I I did know about it. But then around December of 2012, a friend of mine just gave me a Bitcoin as a gift. And Bitcoin was worth $13 at the time. So he gave me 13 bucks. Well, that's nice. And by giving it, I actually I had to install the Bitcoin software 
set up a wallet, you know, for me to receive that one Bitcoin, I had to go through that. We didn't have, you know, mobile wallets and stuff really at the time, or it was not heavily used. So he gave me a Bitcoin, it was worth $13, and I didn't really pay attention to it. And then Bitcoin went through its first, one of its first big bull runs in early um, uh, 2013, uh, because of all things, there was a banking crisis in Cyprus. And that just became a big media hype cycle that, oh, bank problems. And Bitcoin went, like I said, like I, he gave me that one in December of 2012 for $13. In March of 2013, Bitcoin hit, um, uh, it hit like $70. So it was 13. It was now worth 70. I'm like, wow. I mean, that's like, what? That's like four times, 400%. Yeah, four. That's a hell of a return. I mean, buy a stock and get 400% return. So I actually took that one Bitcoin, sent it to Coinbase, sold it, and my wife and I went out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and and at that point, I that little experience was enough for me to go, I'm going to learn more about that. And then I finally did the deep dive. And as a software engineer, I had can do things not other people could do. I downloaded the Bitcoin software and I built it and I studied it and figured out how it worked. And I read the white paper, of course, but I was like, I need to know more that this thing's actually works. So I started writing my own Bitcoin software until I reached where we're like, okay, from a technical standpoint, this thing's solid, it works. And I, that was how I got in. I walked away very like this thing was a really a true remarkable invention. They've solved a problem as a, I really recognize that the the technology works. It's rock solid, and really nothing's changed since then. Everything since then, it's not a question about technology. It's a question of 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 the things we're dealing with today. How is the SEC going to regulate it? Is the government going to declare it illegal? How do you deal with the taxes? All that stuff, and none of that has to do with computer code. So the computer code is solid, it works, and I figured that out for myself. Um, and that was something, you know, I could do as a software engineer that other people, you know, not necessarily can do. We, they, You think of the average person who's not a computer scientist, they have no idea how Bitcoin works. I mean, somebody tries to explain proof of work to them by analogy, but let's be honest, they don't really understand it. So... I uh, a lot of people have concerns about uh, getting hacked or something because it's a digital money about right. it being susceptible to attacks. What made you so confident that it could withstand uh, attacks like that? Well, I mean, I mean, it, 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 I mean, if you just look at it, it works. I mean, it's uh, the, the crypto, the cryptography, which underlies it works. That cryptography has been, is proven rock solid. And that's ultimately it. I mean, you can't break, crypto crypto I mean, cryptography um cryptography works and then the, the the proof of work so so you know we don't need proof of work for the cryptography to work that's why uh, ethereum switched to proof of stake they don't do proof of work anymore okay but their transactions all are still secure and valid because they use cryptography so bitcoin uses cryptography there is really no way to hack you know you can't hack an electric curve it's I'm pretty confident that that's, that's not going to happen. And then the proof of work is, you know, Adam Back invented that and uh, proof of work. I mean, I understand proof of work really well. As a, one of the cool things about proof of work is how simple it is. Like so many things in Bitcoin are actually very complicated. Proof of work is really simple. And I think that a uh, uh, 100 years from now, whatever the equivalent of Wikipedia is in 100 years from now, Adam is going to be, Adam really it's really cool when you invent something that's brand new that ultimately is really simple there's a beauty that's mm -hmm. like with einstein e equals mc squared the greatest dis, you know uh, uh discovery in, in scientific history but it's so simple right like things which are incredibly simple but somebody had to think of it first and adam back invented proof of work and uh it works i mean it's it's pretty cool and just to give an overview, because I know a lot of my listeners aren't super big into Bitcoin, but when I think of proof of work, it's just ha guessing that number, solving some advanced mathematical equation to get a number lower than the solution. And so that number can change depending on like the difficulty adjustment and it, 
and would does the difficulty adjustment inherently go with proof of work or am i mixing things up there thing entirely yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all, all all proof of work all proof of work really is is pick a random number um it, it's basically find a random solution to a math problem where um where it's below a certain value exactly what you said uh, the best analogy I've found to explain it to lay people is Sudoku, because most people are familiar with Sudoku, even if they don't play it, they know what it is. And it takes a very long time to solve a Sudoku puzzle, right? Like it's not, it's very time consuming. But once someone has an answer, it's incredibly easy to tell if their answer is correct or not. Because you mm. just add up all the columns, and if they all add up, then you solved it. So it's incredibly hard to solve, but incredibly easy to verify. And that's how proof of work works. It uses, you know, some hashing algorithm. People don't know what a hash is, and they don't need to know what a hash is necessarily. Just think of a hash as solving a Sudoku puzzle. It's, there, it's the same sort of thing. It's a fancy little piece of math, but it's very hard to solve. Whereas, I mean, when I say a Sudoku puzzle is hard to solve, I, I've never actually done one personally, but... I, you know, I don't know how long people spend solving the Sudoku, but say they spend, you know, one hour solving the Sudoku. Well, we all know finding a hash takes like <laughs> all the computing power of a star or something. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very, very hard Sudoku. <laughs> That's a great analogy. I, I've never heard that one, but, uh, what, what were some of the challenges you saw before, like really starting to think, oh, wait, this is, this is the best solution or any, any FUD that you kind of had that was the most, uh, you gave the most credit. Well, I wrote a blog post, which I may or may not still be online. I think it's still online, but after I got in, after I went through that process of verifying that from a technical standpoint, Bitcoin works, I was like, okay, well, technically it works, but the government's just going to declare it illegal. And, um, that was, uh, not everybody knows all the history, but Bitcoin was not the first digital currency created. Um, there were other digital currencies created prior to Bitcoin, and the people who created those digital currencies are probably, most of them are still sitting in prison, okay? If you create a way to move money around the world, you will be thrown in jail, okay? That was precedent for that. Uh, there was this guy who created something called Liberty Reserve, where he created tokenized gold. So you could send gold back and forth to people, but you didn't actually send them gold. It was just like a Bitcoin transaction. So you would you would effectively have gold and you could buy and sell things and it was all backed by gold digitally. But a guy did this. I don't remember his name, but he's sitting in jail right now, okay? So the precedent had already been set. Governments were like, you cannot create a financial system where you can send money to people peer to peer. We will throw you in prison. So Bitcoin was an invention to make make it so we could send money to each other. And there's no one to send to prison. Nobody knows who Satoshi is and who they're going to send to prison. I mean, like a hundred thousand people run nodes in the world. You're going to send all those people to prison. You don't even know who's running a node. The miners are getting more and more centralized. When Satoshi originally designed Bitcoin, his thought was everybody will just run a computer and, and do their own mining. It would be nice if that was still the case. That is not the case. So mining is actually very centralized. But it is centralized, but it's adaptive. We can adapt, right? So like China banned Bitcoin mining. Did it hurt Bitcoin? No, it did. was barely a hiccup. And that's like, People are like, oh, Biden's going to put a 30% tax on Bitcoin mining. And I'm like, <laughs> go ahead and do it, you idiot. You're just shooting yourself in the foot. The minute he puts a 30% tax on Bitcoin mining, well, it sucks for all the miners in the United States, but all the miners in other countries are going to be like, woohoo, more for us. Because it's yep. just going to move anywhere. Um, and there's a neat thought experiment that didn't occur to me until relatively recently it's just a thought experiment i'm not saying this is practical but but imagine that you went somewhere out in the wilderness completely in the middle of nowhere like there's not a town people anybody for hundreds and hundreds of miles and out here in the wilderness there is a river it's in the middle of nowhere let's imagine it's in the the, the canada somewhere you know so remote it's insane but there's a river there 
And if you put in a little generator in that riveter, so that river is now generating electricity, and then you hook that thing up to a Bitcoin miner, you're like, well, wait a minute, it needs internet. Oh no, Elon Musk created Starlink for us. So you put a Starlink in the middle of nowhere and you could mine Bitcoin. Think about that. That's just incredible. And so Bitcoin mining can move anywhere on the planet. It can quickly move from here to there. So that if, if you know, if Joe Biden wants to tax Bitcoin mining by 30%, I mean, all he's going to do is just move every Bitcoin miner will leave the United States. It ain't going to hurt Bitcoin. It's not going to affect anything. He's going to have accomplished nothing other than put United States behind everybody else. So. And it's such a great opportunity for developing countries where they can't justify investment in large energy plants because they don't have any industry yet. So it's like a, you know, chicken or the egg type thing. But when you have Bitcoin, I think there's a, I forgot what the company is that's going around and doing this, but they're setting up big plants and, you know, like you said, somewhere where there's a river, start mining Bitcoin and then the city can develop around it. Once that city, you know, they can start using the cheap plentiful energy. And once the energy starts getting more and more expensive, they can just hop over and do it again somewhere else. And uh, just the, the benefit it could have for the whole world is awesome. Yeah, I, I'm not a, like a complete expert on this. I, you know, more, more, I'm just repeating things I've read, but the, 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 the people, the, this, um, there's such a naive and simplistic discussion about what are, is a complex topic. But the way I'll explain it is, Let's say you have a river, and this river is flowing 24 hours a day, okay? At nighttime, at 3 a.m., the river does not just suddenly decide to stop running, okay? Electricity demand, we have, you've, everybody's heard of, you know, you know off-peak hours, all right? If a river, if you have a hydroelectric dam and there's a river running, it is constantly generating a constant amount of electricity at all times. Okay, the water's just running, it's moving the turbines. I assume maybe they make, I don't know how dams actually operate if like they, uh, they make adjustments. But the point is, is there's a constant production of electricity from that hydroelectric, but there is not a constant demand. Demand changes, demand changes different times of day, et cetera. To all of these people who are going, oh, Bitcoin uses too much energy. What the hell do they think happens to that energy if there's no buyer for it? There's no one to buy it. Do you think it goes into magic batteries or something? No, it goes nowhere. So the fact that Bitcoin can provide a market for off-peak energy is actually, you know, people talked about this, about how it can stabilize the grid. And like I said, I'm not an expert, but I mean, it makes sense as soon as you take a, a second and think about it. So... The, this whole idea of Bitcoin using too much energy, when in fact it can be a very positive thing, it can make, um, you know, there's a lot of, so we are not in, we are not short of energy on this planet, okay? There's enormous amounts of energy on this planet just from the, the sun hitting, hitting, you know, the earth. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the example of, okay, there's a river out in the middle of nowhere. Well, that's energy, but no one's using the energy because transporting energy it, you can only transport electricity a certain distance. It has a limit to how far it can go. So if there's a source of energy that's nowhere near human beings, we're just that energy isn't isn't getting getting used. So creating new clean energy power plants is a huge capital investment. Having a buyer of last resort in the form of Bitcoin uh, allows us to build more clean energy. So. I'm fine if they want to pass a law that says all, if they passed a law tomorrow that said all Bitcoin mining must only use clean energy, that'd be fine. Well, I'm pretty sure we can work, we can work with that. Okay. We'll just put solar plants everywhere. It's not a problem. Um, so they need a more nuanced uh, discussion on the topic. Um, but I don't know. There's, there's a lot of craziness going on yeah, there right now. And I, I was on, I mean, a, a submarine, so we had the nuclear power and right. all those nuclear power plants, at least most of the designs, I believe, have a minimum steam demand they must have when they're up and running or else, you know, you need to just shut them down. And so that's a great, if you don't have pl things that are generating pow or power or demand electricity, you're, you got to shut it down, but you can always have that with Bitcoin. So it's just right. so many possibilities. I like the idea of it, it providing funding for, for new power plants. I, I like that. Yeah. 
any uh so i could talk about bitcoin all day is there is there any big takeaways you have for bit for the new listeners that I, I a lot of my listeners are not bitcoiners but i talk about bitcoin all the time because i'm sure, trying to sure. orange pill them but you know yeah. I, I i don't have much to say that anybody else hasn't already said a, a a zillion times i think bitcoin remains so they're different different people have different agendas within bitcoin things they want from it and, and they want it to be calm i get a lot of sense on on twitter on the sort of Bitcoin Twitter, there's some things that I read and I'm like, you're talking about it, you must see a different Bitcoin than I do. People think that Bitcoin is stagnant, that it's a failure, that it hasn't accomplished. But if you go back, um, uh, I've been I've been through this thing a long time. And in the early days, what we would talk about all the time is Bitcoin as the new gold, okay? The, the, the reason that Bitcoin mining is called mining is because Satoshi used the analogy of gold on purpose. So um, there's a lot of things in this world where you go and you say, well, it's kind of like this, and you're stretching the analogy. There is no stretch of the analogy of Bitcoin to gold. It was done on purpose. Satoshi tried to copy gold, physical gold, in digital form. Okay, that's so that is not a bogus comparison. That is that is the way it was designed. And if you go back to the white paper and read all the early discussions. So when I got involved in Bitcoin, that was all we were talking about. Not like, oh, how can I send a microtransaction to some villager in Africa? I mean, that wasn't the focus. The focus is, can this be the new gold, the better gold? Mm -hmm. And a, I'm, very, I'm still very excited about uh, layer two solutions, microtransactions, the lightning network, all these payment use cases and other ways people can use it. But at the end of the day, I got into Bitcoin as a better gold than gold. That was my thesis. When I put my own personal money and said, I'm going to invest in this, it was someday Bitcoin will be as big as gold. And it hasn't changed. I still, I still want all these other things, but I don't think we need them. I think that Bitcoin replaces gold, um, that's phenomenal. We have this store of value because gold is not rare, okay? The only reason gold has value is because it's rare, but it's actually not rare. I mean, there's asteroids that have trillions of dollars of gold. There's gold in the ocean. There's gold and we're finding new gold all the time. I and mean, gold ultimately, certainly at a, at a, at a, a, even at the, at the scale of our solar system, is not a rare thing. So Bitcoin is truly rare because it's digital scarcity. So I'm still on board uh, for Bitcoin to be to to really take a dent out of gold. And we had a lot of runway for bit if bit if Bitcoin was worth had the same market cap as gold, one Bitcoin would be worth somewhere on the order of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You know that's that's where I'm 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 in my mind is at. Um, and I think we're on the path. I think that's, I think it needs, you know, gold's been around for 5,000 years. Human beings have used gold. I'm not anti-gold or anything. It's It's been this commodity that we have found useful for entire, for all of recorded human history. So uh, gold, Bitcoin has only got a, what, 13 year, 14 year history. Um, yeah. I totally understand why people are not comfortable putting everything into Bitcoin. Um, um, it's the thing has been it, besides the volatility, it's just, I mean, it's a lot, but over time, if Bitcoin continues to be accepted, if we get this black rock thing, um, it, the, the funny thing is, cause I look at the math, I don't, I think one of the biggest con misconceptions with Bitcoin is people do not understand how rare Bitcoin is. That, that's the, I think that's the number one thing. People do not have a mental frame of how freaking rare it is. If you yeah. own one whole Bitcoin, the, people do not fully grasp just the rarity of that. And, and uh, people use this analogy all the time, but it's relevant, which is if every millionaire in the world wanted to own a Bitcoin, well, they can't. Because yeah. there's only about 19 million Bitcoins and there's, you know, 50 million millionaires in the world. So forget about the millionaires. What about the retirement funds? What about the, you know, every single investment firm? 
So the amount of Bitcoin there is, if if everybody, if if tomorrow everybody said, you know what, I should just have a one percent, barely dip my toe in to Bitcoin. Like I don't know, I'm not sketchy about this, this Bitcoin thing. I'm a little nervous, but you know, I can allocate one percent. If everybody put one percent in Bitcoin, <laughs> it would exceed the market cap of gold in about a split second, and and that's what people don't fully mentally grasp is how rare it is and how rapidly things could change. So we're sitting at, I don't know what the price is, right? That's 25 grand or 26 grand. Bitcoin could go up to 200, 300 grand so fast. It will like, and it's a mathematical thing. Like I'm not making some prediction based on my emotions. It's a mathematical prediction. If the, if the demand, and that's what the BlackRock thing signifies. BlackRock signifies that that they're basically anointing saying, okay, traditional finance, traditional investing, you can dip your toe in. These guys are not gonna go and put their entire portfolio in Bitcoin, but if they put just a tiniest bit of it spread across, yeah. it, it's it's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, I had a lot more Bitcoin at one time than I have today. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of people who got in got in early. Um, and that's a journey we all, we all go on. I mean, everybody, you know, they, whatever kind of investing you're in, but if you've put some of your money in Bitcoin, you're, you're putting it in there for whatever thesis you've got, ultimately you want it to increase in value and, you know, when it increases in value, when do you take that value and transform it into something else? And we've all gone through this. I got the very, actually, it's a good part of my story was I got that that $13 Bitcoin, I sold it at 70. And then I immediately turned around and I started buying Bitcoin. And uh, I went through all these emotions. I bought it at 100 and then the price dropped to 60. Oh my God, I lost all my money. And it went up to 100, Whoa, I'm rich. And I went through all these sort of naive newbie emotions. Uh, it was, you know, my journey. Everybody goes through that journey no matter what price they got into, but, um, I bought the majority of my Bitcoin at an average price of around $80. Well, in November of 2013, the price of Bit or October, November of 2013, the price of Bitcoin hit $350. So imagine I paid $80. It's now worth $350. That's a 400. I'm trying to do that with a stock. I mean, <laughs> buy a stock and see it go up 4X in value in six months. It happens, but not, not that often. So... At this point, I had done really well. Like by any thesis, you know, making the four hundred percent return in six months is is an awesome return. And everybody oh, yeah. was I was getting a lot of social pressure that I should sell my Bitcoin because I just made a shit ton of money. You should be done with it, right? Like you invested money, you made four times your investment, sell it. So I had this enormous amount of pressure from from co-workers and friends who were giving me advice and like sell it sell it you did get out while you can so i did i sold a huge chunk of the bitcoin and then bought a sports car so that was my very first time i took profit and what did i get out of it i got a sports car and then i turned around and i immediately put all that money back into bitcoin because i was like well, i don't have my bitcoin now so i put my money back in and that was 2013 i didn't sell bitcoin again until 2017. So is that 20, because well the price went way down price went yeah. up uh, Mount Gox collapsed and it we went into a bear market so I just sat there and I waited and I waited and I waited and I didn't do anything well in 2017 Bitcoin broke a thousand and I know maybe that sounds silly now but let me tell you thousand dollar Bitcoin was a massive like if you go back to those days, people like someday my Bitcoin's gonna be worth a thousand dollars. It was everybody's <laughs> dream was for Bitcoin to hit a grand. So when it hit a grand, I sold a bunch, and I paid off my kids' student loans. And in my head at the time, I was like, I have accomplished a major like this in this thing uh, accomplished this effect in my life which is my kids, between my two kids, they had collectively like a little over $100,000 in student loan debt. And they, it was their debt, you know, it was theirs, but I had had this windfall and I got to change their lives because by paying off their student loans, it was life-changing to them. Oh yeah. So that was my first big 
thing where I, and I, and I, to this day, you can look back and go, you sold those Bitcoin at a thousand dollars. I don't regret it because at that time it was the right decision and I changed my kids' lives and I could have like, so, you know, the first time I bought a cool sports car, that was a win. Like if I got nothing else out of Bitcoin, but a cool sports car, that was a win. And the next time it was, I paid off my kids' student loans and that changed their lives. And then after 2017, I didn't sell any Bitcoin again for a really long time. <laughs> and then I bought a house. <laughs> and now I'm like, you know, I, I really don't have anything to sell my Bitcoin for anymore. I don't, there's nothing I want. I mean, I've, I'm like, now I'm just on for the ride. So the Bitcoin I have left, I'm just basically, I'm, I decided talking to my wife and myself, I've decided with the Bitcoin I have left, I'm just going to make it last until I'm dead. <laughs> well, I think that's a great story on time preference because in the Bitcoin community, they preach and preach low time preference, yeah. but life isn't always low time preference. There's those, you got to live your life and there's things that you want that come up. And I think that's totally valid to, you know, when you, when you have the money and, and it rewards you like that, you, you know, take, take a bite and enjoy it. So I'm glad and, you did and, that. And that's the lesson because I have, you know, over the years, I've talked to so many people who got into Bitcoin at whatever point they got into Bitcoin and they did what I did. It was worth more and they sold it. Well, I have sold my Bitcoin probably, I don't I mean, because on the order of four or five times, something like that. Okay. Well, I still have a lot of Bitcoin. It's because you never freaking sell all of it. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with selling a little bit of it, but if you sell all your Bitcoin, and I met so many people who they reach some point where like, oh my God, I can I can get a down payment on a new house. I can pay off my student loans. Right? And what they do is they reach and they sold all their Bitcoin and they achieved that life goal, which was great and, and wonderful, uh, but they don't have any Bitcoin left. So that's the magic rule is take profit when it's the right time for you in your life if you're fortunate enough to experience being in profit and just don't ever sell all your Bitcoin. And I've always told anybody, like, if you get into Bitcoin, you must have a very long time preference um, because it's, it's, it, it is what it is. And the thing about this time preference thing, it is just such a valuable life lesson. Like here's, here's my thing. Um, I like to tell this anecdote because uh, do you remember when Instagram was like the hot hotness everybody was on instagram do you yep. remember this thing called the fire festival oh yeah the i saw the right. documentary right so the fire festival was an instagram fueled thing it was a time uh it was a time in uh in america and this social media phenomena well what people were doing is they were going into debt to project an image of wealth on instagram they were so addicted to that feedback loop. People were going out and having expensive dinners at fancy restaurants. I don't even know if they tasted the food because all they cared about was taking a picture of their plate and then posting it on Instagram and getting that feedback loop of people clicking like. Fire Festival, the whole Fire Festival is the absolute extreme expression of that era. People wanted to go to Fire Festival so that they could post their pictures on Instagram and have this... It, this so what we were at a time where young people were going into extravagant debt to give off an image of a lifestyle that a they weren't even enjoying it wasn't a legit lifestyle because they went into debt for it um and it was really a negative negative thing like i can think of almost nothing positive about that now let's flip the bitcoin Okay, bitcoin is this weird wacky tech bro high risk you're an idiot but everybody who got into Bitcoin, all of a sudden, all they think about is saving. I want more money. I want, or I want to stack more sats. I'm going to drive a junker car because why would I have a fancy car? Like you see this cultural phenomenon of young people priding themselves on living, living a lifestyle that does not exceed their income so that they can grow wealth and have a very long time preference. So... I can't find that. I think that is a hundred percent positive thing. So we went from young people going into debt to project a lifestyle that wasn't even theirs to now we have young people living beneath their means, saving, investing, having a longer time frame outlook. To me, that is all positive. 
And if they were buying gold instead of Bitcoin, I'd still say all those positive things. Because learning how to have a long time preference, learning to live beneath your means, beginning to invest and save, these are all super positive things. And independent of Bitcoin, they're just good life, they're good life practices. So I, I speak very positively. So every time I hear of a young person stacking sats, it just makes me feel good. I, I think that's fantastic. And, and it's really great that they're doing that. I love the, um, on this social media platform that uh, Jack made, uh, Noster in OSTR, they have a culture of if somebody tweets something that I really like, I'll send him some sats to say thank you. Unfortunately, Noster just doesn't, the way social media networks it, it work, you have to have a large number of people for it to build traction, and it doesn't have that traction. But it has a great just culture. Yet. I go yep. on to Noster. I like the culture. I like the people there. It's just there's just not enough at the time. Um, and now so. Apple's kicking off Domus from the, the app store. So that's going to be another hurdle, but I'm, yeah. I'm bullish long-term on, on Nostra. I think that, like you said, it's just a great way for value for value and saving. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's my, that's my thing. I, I, I want to, there's so many people piss on Bitcoin and say negative things about it and then say it's evil and it's awful without acknowledging all these positive effects that it's had. I mean, I've seen a real change in the way young people's attitudes are. Now, there's still kids going into debt to post pictures on Instagram. I suppose they're, they're, it's probably still happening. But um, I sure see a lot of young people who are have a longer-term outlook, focus on investing, and have deprioritized um, uh, trying to project. And I think it is generally a negative to when you're trying to project an image of wealth to the external world, especially if, first of all, you're just trying to project an image of wealth to begin with, it's because you're looking for uh, validation from others. You want other people to, like, if you drive a Mercedes, it ain't because you like to drive a Mercedes, it's because you want other people to know that you got a Mercedes, that you got enough money to drive one. Like, I don't, I don't know, who the hell buys a Mercedes because, yeah, this is the best driving, handling car in the world. No, it's because it's a Mercedes. I mean, come on. So that 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 young people are not living be beyond their means, I think, is a, is a really positive thing. And, you know, it's not a healthy thing for you to run your life to get validation from others. Like if you want to if you want to drive a fancy car because you love it and it makes you happy, fantastic. But if the reason you bought it is because of how other people think of it, that's that's not good. Like that's a. And it's funny because huge segments of our economy actually revolve around this, which is fashion. Um, the entire, like, all of fashion is how do other people think about how they I look, the way I wear, <laughs> the, the clothes I wear. And I've always found like I appreciate fashion because it's artistic and I like mm -hmm. I like beautiful things. Uh, but people who like have to have designer bags and wear designer clothes. Uh, yeah, I can't wrap my brain around that. Yeah, that makes me think uh, I'm a big Ayn Rand fan and she talks about secondhandedness and really talks bad about, you know, it should be within yourself. You should be able to pride yourself in, and get your happiness from that and not from outside influence and, and secondhand, secondhandedness. Well, and I think that in general, that's just important. Happiness is something we all pursue and um, and it's, it's very, it, it's really, you've got to ask yourself what, People spend a lot of time going, if I just had this, I'd be happy. If I just had this, I'd be happy. And when they get the thing, and they're not actually happy. Like, they get it. And I, I my my favorite thing with this was with sports cars is I'm, I'm very fascinated by the ultra wealthy. Like, the people, so it's, it's an interest. So most people do not have wealth, like, statistically it's that's why they're called the one percenters right like most people 99 percent don't have enormous wealth so it's not part of of normal human experience to have lots of wealth that's that's relatively rare but for those people who do have enormous wealth um what do they do with that wealth and there is such a thing as having enough money like every person 
there's a there's an amount of money which is enough money you want to live a lifestyle whatever that lifestyle is that gives you joy and happiness and lets you do the things you need a certain amount of of money to do that and everybody's going to have a different number but you know culturally it'd be like oh if i had two hundred thousand dollars a year if i made two hundred thousand dollars a year i'd be you know everything i my dreams would be fulfilled okay so say you make say that's it in your head i need oh, but uh oh you did really well and you make a million dollars a year but you just said 200 grand is all you need what are you gonna do with that other eight hundred thousand dollars what do you do it and so many wealthy people they they buy a sports car right you make good money that's one of the first things men want to do is they, a lot of men they want to have a sports car well now they have more money they buy another sports car like wait a minute if the first sports car didn't make you happy what was a second sports car going to make you happy? next thing you know they got five sports cars okay are you five times happier now and then they go and they start buying more houses. Ah, one house isn't enough. I got a house in Hawaii. I got a house in LA. And I got to have a house in Milan. I'm like, I don't get it. But they do it. I mean, when they have that extreme wealth, they they start acquiring more and more material things. And I'm like, if one material, and I I had a personal experience at a very very low level where I bought a second house, and it wasn't for me. It was actually for my relatives to. It was for my relatives. I was trying to help them out. But legally, I was the legal owner of the house. And it was a complete freaking nightmare. I had to deal with the HOA. I had to deal mm -hmm. with property taxes, insurance. And then somebody got injured on the property and I got sued. And I was wow. this, this direct personal experience that, you know, having more than, as you begin to acquire more material things, they don't come without, they come with baggage. They come with, you know, in, in our, our, our society, they don't just let you own property for, for, for nothing. Any piece of property you own, a house, a car, it's got to have insurance. So what if somebody gets hurt? There's liability and registration fees and taxes. So acquiring more material things is also acquiring more headaches. And then you look at these really wealthy guys, like the crazy hundred billion billionaires, they got to hire a team of people just to manage their shit. Now they got to have employees just to manage their lives. So this idea that more wealth makes you happier is like, there is certainly a certain level of wealth where you can do the things you want to do. But I do think there's a, there's a point where more above and beyond that, I, I would like to talk to more really wealthy people and try to understand and for me, I mean, I know the answer for myself. If somebody just said, here, John has $100 million. I have no use for $100 million personally. So all, my only focus is how can I give this away to other people so their lives are better? Like, I, like I have, like, like if somebody gave me a million dollars right now today, there's literally nothing I want to buy. There's nothing I want. There's, I have no, like, I hit, I'm very fortunate. I hit my sweet spot and I don't want to go beyond it. And I'm kind of curious for the people who go beyond it. And if people who haven't hit it yet, that's the drive that keeps us going, right? Like we, we, we strive for that. There's things we want in our lives that we work towards to, to reach those goals. And I think that's very healthy. That's what motivates us. It's what makes us do the things we want, we do to, to, to get there. So it's interesting. And I, and I think, yeah, and I don't think it's a hundred percent black and white. I think there are those really wealthy people that just really enjoy the, the, I don't know, I don't want to call it a game, but the game so much and the, and the, the process, I, I think, uh, of Gary Vaynerchuk, the guy that wants to buy, he wants to buy the jets mm -hmm. and he, I listen to his podcast. He says he, he kind of doesn't want to buy the jets. You know, he's going to be kind of sad when that actually happens because he loves the process of, of trying to accumulate enough to eventually have the opportunity to buy the jets so much that when he actually gets the jets, he's going to have to you know, reevaluate, okay, what's next type thing. But it's, and it's not, and that one doesn't seem, it's not second handed. It's more just internal. And mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think that's a healthy way to look at it. Yeah. And then the other thing, like I, um, my whole career, you know, I, there's always been bosses and then the CEO. And I'm, so I've been in my last job, you know, I was, uh, you know, the, the CEOs, you know, very very wealthy man i mean like these people who like they never have to work another day for the rest of their life but they do it anyway and they've got their own motivations but to their credit 
they create jobs and God bless them for doing that. I mean, it, it, CEOs of companies are creating jobs and the amount of stress that they take on to do that. Like, yeah. my God, <laughs> dude, n nobody knows the stress of having employees. I've been very <laughs> fortunate as an engineer. I have never had an employee in my life. And, uh, uh, but I, when you have a company and you got X number of people and they've got wives and kids and the amount of stress that puts on you at a personal level, um, you're doing a good thing. Giving people jobs is a really positive, wonderful thing. Um, in fact, you know, you you were going to ask about this, about an artist website I set up is I would rather pay someone money to do a job than to give money to charity. Like that is if, if nothing totally wrong with giving money to charity. I mean, that's good, but paying someone, I don't know, everybody thinks of it this way, but paying someone to do a job is way better than donating money to a charity in, in my personal opinion. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree. Can you tell uh, us about, about art, about an artist, there, about there how you started that? Yeah, there isn't much to it because it doesn't hardly exist. It was more an idea and, and I haven't a hundred percent given up on it, but when COVID hit, everybody was, you know, they shut everything down all over the place and everybody was, was talking about that. They did that uh, paycheck protection program, the COVID relief funds, and they were like, okay, we shut down all the restaurants. Therefore, all these people who worked at the restaurants don't have jobs. And, and so it was, it was obvious where this need was. And as you, we know, they, you know, that was a complete mess the way they handled that but the yeah. impetus the impetus for it was understandable i mean here's this this virus has come along these people will work we got to do something for them. but i never heard anybody talking about artists so yeah it's fine to talk about the the the, the waiter or waitress who you know the, the the restaurant worker who can't work but what about the the dance performer the musician the i mean all of these other they all lost their jobs too especially the performing arts um, where people would go into a, a, a bar and, and play a gig. Well, no work for them. And I felt like nobody was thinking about them. So I had limited resources, but I was like, well, I can do something. So I uh, did this about an artist thing where the idea was that I would provide money to an artist and showcase their work. And I did that and it was, uh, I, I don't know, I was just sort of for fun. I was thinking maybe I could build it as an actual charity where there'd be enough money getting donated that we could, you know, take that further. Uh, it, that didn't really happen. Uh, and I don't know that I, but I did it out of my own pocket. So I took like four or five artists and I hired a video editor to, um, this is my favorite thing. I, I like to produce. So that, that's the thing that I love. Like that's something I, the only thing that would get me excited right now um, uh, is to continue to do that. Like if I had a lot of extra money, that's the kind of thing I would do with it is I would, I would produce, whether it was to make a movie or a film or, or whatever. So a lot of these content creators on, whether content creators all over, whether it's Twitch or YouTube or, or wherever they're, and uh, I love the hustle of those guys. I love the way that a, one individual person can take their art, create some content, put it out to the world. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I started watching Mr. Beast when he had less than a million subscribers. So I've seen his entire trajectory. Like I was following yeah. every video he published. And there was this uh, one guy, he popped up on uh, my YouTube channel uh, his name's Billy Wilkins, and um, he got hit by COVID. So this is a guy who's gigging every weekend, live musician, whole band, unbelievably talented. And that was his life. He would go and gig every weekend, and he went from that to nothing. And he didn't yep. know what to do with himself. So he started making YouTube content, and... I stumbled, you know, whatever reason, the YouTube algorithm, and he's a crazy talented guy. And uh, uh, I did this, got this idea to do this about an artist thing, and I had him as my very first artist that I sponsored. And when I met him, he had under 40,000 subscribers. He's at almost 400,000 today. He's 
um, doing really, really well. And I did this documentary about him. I gave him uh, some money for his uh, participation. So it was a way of me being a patron of the arts. I hired a video editor who she interviewed him, produced a professional, really nice 30 minute long documentary about this guy. And I just, I just enjoyed the heck out of it. And I hope I get to do it more. Uh, but you know what? It doesn't matter if I never did any more. There was four artists that I, I did something for. I provided income, you know, they, that was money they didn't have during a difficult time. Um, and I just, I really like producing. Like I, I'm in the video game industry. I'm a software engineer. I primarily do all the coding. Uh, but on several video games that I did, I was the producer. I did everything. Like I hired the artist, I hired the musicians, I managed them. And when I go back and I look back, what did I enjoy the most of my career in video games? It wasn't programming. It was working with the musicians and the artists. So that just, to this day, I still love that. And I'd like to keep doing that. So right now, the About an Artist uh, effort is kind of dead, but I, I'll probably bring it back at some point. Like, Bitcoin hits hundred thousand dollars. I'll, huh, I'll tear off a chunk and throw it at some artists. Uh, I'd like to still keep doing that. Uh, but if you ever get a chance to see the uh, Billy Wilkins documentary, and then I also did one on Cole Lamb. Do you know who Cole Lamb is? The the guy from the UK, the kid mm -hmm. pianist. Yeah, that one was. He was. Yeah, he was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Did you did you know his name from my website, or because you knew him before? Well, that's, that's where I found it on your website. Oh, but, well, he's, most yeah. people know him, even though they don't know his name. One of his videos has 110 million views on YouTube, which, wow, is, yeah, that's, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if you watched his documentary, but it's really, really good. Um, yeah, I'll and, put, a, I'll put a link to the show notes and it's, it's really well done. It, like the, the creator you coordinated, collaborated with, she did a great job interviewing and it's all high quality and really good artists. So if, uh, I, I look forward to, cause Bitcoin's hitting a hundred K yeah. soon in, in my book. So yeah, soon, <laughs> I think it's going to so. happen sooner than you know it. Yeah. And then, and sort of w with tangent, but it was circling back to something we talked about earlier, I was thought I was going to finish, which is when I got into Bitcoin early on and I vetted it technically, I just, I realized early on the biggest risk to Bitcoin is just governments are going to declare it illegal. And I, um, if you talk to other people in the Bitcoin community, go, well, I don't care if the government declares it illegal. Doesn't matter to me. I'm going to use it anyway. And I'm like, yeah, you're going to be using an illegal black market currency. And if that's what you want is an illegal <laughs> black market currency. Good for you. But <laughs> That just doesn't mean, like, I don't have much use for a currency that I can only use to buy, like, you know, use illegally. That's not of interest to me. So if you talk to other people in the Bitcoin community, they go, if the government makes it illegal, it won't matter to me. Well, it'll matter to me. Like, if, if the government makes it illegal, I follow the law of the country I live in. And I kind of, I told my wife this back in 2013, and it's funny that 10 years later it's still true, is I told her this back then. I said, there's a legitimate scenario where the only way we can use our Bitcoin is to go to a foreign country where it's legal. And that's shocking that that's still so true today. I mean, that we might all have to go to El Salvador if we want to spend our Bitcoin. Okay, well, Salvador sounds like a nice place to go on vacation. Um, I, with things that are happening right now with the SEC and this BlackRock thing, I think the, 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 there's another alternative. The government could declare it illegal, and they could do that. There's an alternative, which is that the government doesn't declare it illegal, but they try to control it. You're like, well, how can the government control Bitcoin? Well, the thing is, there's only 19 million Bitcoin. I already get a little bit about how rare it is, okay? Government has a little thing called taxes. So the government can take all of our Bitcoin through taxation over time. It will happen immediately, but as, as it gets recycled and recycled and recycled, the government keeps getting its cut. So the government can declare it illegal. That's one option. The other option is they can say, no, you can have your Bitcoin, but you can only use it on major exchanges. It's going to be full AML KYC. Taxes are going to get taken out of automatic. This all sounds awful, right? I mean, it's pretty, oh, yeah. pretty dystopian. Negative. Okay. Yeah. Except that 
this dystopian scenario also makes us yeah. all incredibly rich, right? Like because <laughs> in that scenario, Bitcoin goes up to gazillions of dollars, and you know they've and I actually I get the sense that's the path they're going on because once Bitcoin is accepted. Remember I said earlier, I said, you know, maybe oh, whatever, there's 10 million people who say they own Bitcoin, but in reality, only the low tens of thousands actually control their own private keys. If the government doesn't declare Bitcoin and they instead go down this different route where it's it's under BlackRock and and all these big investment vehicles and all these people come in, where do you think all the Bitcoin is going to be? Well, 95 percent of all Bitcoin will be sitting Fidelity and BlackRock. Well, then it's not a problem for the government because that little 5%, that's not such a problem. They're now able to track it, tax it, collect it. I actually think that's the path we're on. I think that's where it's heading. It's been heading that way for a long time anyway. And I think that's where we're going is Bitcoin is going to be sort of tamed. They're going to try to tame it. And in reality, where does those where do those 19 million bitcoin reside well if we're in a scenario where where 98 percent of all bitcoin is held in institutional situations that the government has no problem with well all of a sudden that two or five percent of people who self-custody it's not a big deal and i kind of it gives me the sense that's where where we're headed do you does that concern you like a 51 percent attack or like a centralization risk no, no, no. This is just about who Where, owns the Bitcoin is all. No, this is who owns You don't think... It. I guess some you arguments I've heard is... can't attack Bitcoin by virtue of... We're not proof of stake. You can't attack Bitcoin by virtue of who owns the most. Because even if they do fork, then that that's almost better for the the people that stick with the original code, I would imagine. I don't, I don't really care about forks. I mean, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. If they want to fork Bitcoin and create, you know, some ESG coin, good for them. Thank you. I will take my airdrop. Give me my airdrop now. I mean, that we went through all this in uh, 2017. 2017 was when the, uh, the fork wars happened. So I lived through it all. It's not abstract to me. People were creating a new Bitcoin fork every 24 hours. It was ridiculous. With like these meme coins. People don't even probably remember this. Like, oh, well, I know uh, Bcash. That's a fork of Bitcoin. Well, you realize there's like 50 other forks of Bitcoin. People were forking Bitcoin every week. There were so many airdrops. It was insane. So wow. we've already been through all this. You can fork <laughs> Bitcoin all you want. Nobody cares. Like, no one freaking cares. So if they want to go and create a proof of stake, energy efficient Bitcoin for Wall Street, thanks. Sure. I'll take my free Wall Street coins. Thank you very much. I mean, that <laughs> forks are pretty low on my concern. And if all the uh all the Bitcoin is concentrated in 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 large holders, uh, I mean that's the way the world works already, right? Like most of the wealth is in the hands of the big guys. That's just how things already work. So society yeah. is going to move that value around. So, and I, I I wanted to get into your story. I know I've gone over about an hour and a quarter, but uh, do you do you have time if we, I can uh, ask sure. some questions about your your software days? Sure, sure. So you're talking about about an artist and being interested in art. Do you remember when you first uh, developed the kind of a love for art? Yeah, my mother was a really, really talented artist, and uh, I was doing art from the i I have a i I have a well. I now that the story is less more creepy than cute, I guess. But when I was I this memory when I was like four or five years old, I uh, did some drawings, uh, and in exchange, I asked the neighbor girl to give me a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and it shows how how uh, warped my young mind was even back then. But no, Sleek. I was. I was drawing from the age of five, and when I was six or seven years old, I had uh, there was a local newspaper where they kids could send in their drawings, and then they would publish them in the paper. And I like got published two or three times. And my brother did a couple of times. My brother was a really good artist too. So you know, I art. I really love art. I'm reasonably good at it. And you know, you don't make the thing is it's very hard to have a career in art. So. I was also really good at programming computers. So it's like, you know, 
Well, I could future in art and make no money or program computers that make money. So I'm an artist who, pro and I'm one of those guys. It's interesting, uh, software, they call it software engineering. Uh, programming a computer is an engineering discipline. Um, you can go to school, they can teach you algorithms, they can teach you things, and then you can go get a job and you can take what you learned in school and apply it. And there's nothing wrong with that and zillions of people. But another way to look at it is programming a computer is an artistic endeavor. And when you do a work of art, you get an idea in your head and you go, okay, I'm going to do this thing. And then you use pens, pencils, paintbrushes, and take something that's in your mind and turn it into this thing. Programming is exactly identical. In your head, you think, I'm going to write a computer program and it's going to do these things. Like I was describing this, this animation thing I want to do. I'm imagining that in my head. I've not literally written a single line of code yet. I'm thinking it up in my brain. And then when I take it out of my head and turn it into computer code, that is an artistic expression no different than picking up a paintbrush. And I've always been very creative with coding and uh, enjoy coding. I'm really good at it. Um, so it, to me, it, it it's a good match. And I found that when I started doing programming professionally, I couldn't do art anymore. I only, you only have so much in your creativity in you and like you get exhausted. And when I retired, that was always been for years. I was like, when I retire, I'm going to go back to doing art. And I've, I've done that. When I, when I retired, the first thing I did is I started taking some art courses and doing art and I'm still doing that. And, and I hardly do any programming anymore now that I'm retired. Just a little That's bit. That's awesome. It, it, is that why, what kind of drew you to video games in this, in the sector of kind of software, because you could have more expression. Cause I think of video games as, as art. Yeah, no, that exactly that. And, um, it was, um, I can, you know, tell the old, old stories or the old anecdotes, uh, but, uh, I, I'll say this, it, it, I may be, there's a strong possibility. I'm the only person on the planet who ever got a contract with electronic arts by sending in a cold call letter into their mail room. Wow. <laughs> I don't know of anybody else ever who's got that story. And uh, I had this idea for a video game, and uh, it was a first-person shooter was the idea for the video game, and I created a piece of technology to render a 3D landscape in real time. I realized this is back in, like, 1983 when rendering in 3D was... <laughs> on an 8088 PC was really, like, crazy advanced technically. So I made this little demo where you could run around a 3D landscape, and the intention, it was going to be a first-person shooter. So I put that on a floppy disk, uh, <laughs> a, a, a actual demo that showed the, the idea, and then I did a drawing. I did an actual drawing of of illustration for the game and then wrote a letter saying here's my cool idea for a video game and i literally to electronic arts mail room and and put it in the mail i mean what a crazy freaking idea so some guy in the mail room actually john manley john manley worked in the in the mail room and he saw my letter he opened it up and I guess he ran the program and goes, wow, this guy can program. I mean, because it was a cool, <laughs> it was basically a tech demo. And he showed it to a friend of his at Electronic Arts who was an assistant producer named Paul Grace. And Paul Grace is an associate producer, assist, associate producer, not a producer. So he he had relatively little power. Like as, a, as an associate producer, he, he couldn't do a lot, but he... He loved games, and and uh, Paul loved making games. He loved the idea of making these ideas, but he wasn't a software engineer himself. So when he saw my tech demo, his his eyes lit up. He goes, oh, well, I got this kid. He can program, and I want to do this video game. So I get a phone call from somebody at Electronic Arts. To me, it's like the biggest phone call of my life. And he goes, yeah, I saw your uh, thing you sent in. It looks pretty cool. Uh, first question I have for you, how stuck are you on this idea of doing this first-person shooter? I said, I 
don't care. I'll do any <laughs> game you want me to do. And that's what he wanted to hear. And he wanted to do an nuclear submarine simulator. And somehow my visualization that I had done, he figured it would be cool for a submarine simulator. I don't know. I don't know anything about submarines. I frankly, it wasn't my thing. <laughs> um, I, I really wanted to do this first person shooter. I did eventually get to do the first person shooter that I wanted to do. Uh, I love that game. So I can't take any credit for these two submarine games. It was really Paul Grace. It was his idea. He became a producer. And uh, the other sort of funny story about this game, 688 Attack Sub, so this is when Tom Clancy books were blowing up. They were Tom mm -hmm. Clancy movies and Tom Clancy books. So submarines were like really a big pop culture thing at the time. And um, we did this this uh, uh, submarine game. Well, because of the way that contract came about, I was literally, I had a full-time job. I worked at uh, St. Louis University Hospital at the time doing cardiovascular research. So my day job was doing research for drug studies uh, halters, uh, echocardiograms, all of that. That was my job. I was published in the American Heart Journal, American Journal of Cardiology. Like, that was who I was. But I knew I'd rather make video games because it was way more fun. <laughs> so he gives me this contract. I have a full-time job, and I'm trying to write this video game by myself in at home in the evenings and weekends. It took forever to write the game, way longer than it should have. And then when the game got done, Electronic Arts spent almost no money on the game. Like, I think my entire advances on royalties were like $20,000. You know, wow. t today a video game has, like, the budgets for a video game to, like, today are like $150, $200 billion just to make one game. So they gave Jeez. me a $20,000 advance. So Electronic Arts had no money in this game. They had invested nothing in it. This was really just Paul Grace's pet project. He found me to write the game, and then he wanted... So the funny thing is, when the game was finished, Electronic Arts didn't know what the hell to do with it. So they'd spent almost no money on it. They didn't know what to do with it. So I told you that I may be the only person who ever got a game contract by just sending a letter to Electronic Arts. Here's another thing that I, I'm almost sure I was the first one ever, ever in the history of video games, was to make a free demo copy of the game. Now that's common now. Like... It, Nobody would expect to pay money for a game without being able to play a demo first. I mean, we just assumed that. But there was a time where that had never happened before. Okay? So Electronic Arts got this idea, the marketing department. They're like, well, so the, what they, this is back in the old days, people would get floppy disks. That's how you used your computer. You insert a little floppy disk and, and you would store your work on it or whatever. Video games were delivered on floppy disks. And yeah. floppy disks were big business. So there was a company called Baxell, and they sold more floppy disks, you know, probably than anybody else in the world. So Electronic Arts struck a deal with Maxell so that every time you bought a 10 pack of floppy disks, there was an 11th floppy disk in it, which had 680 attack sub for free. And it was the, the full, full game? Full game, only <laughs> one level. You could only play one uh... level. But it wasn't gimped out. I mean, it was the game. You had the. And this was the marketing department's idea because it cost them no money at all. And every remember this conversation at Electronic Arts that everybody thought we were nuts giving away a game for free. Like, why would anybody buy the game if you give it away for free? And they're like, well, the game didn't cost us anything, so what the hell? So it was a very much just throw it up in the air and see what happens. So at Consumer Electronics Show that year, there were billboards all over downtown Las Vegas with a 680 to tech sub coming up out of the ocean, <laughs> and it was a, like, Max L spent a shit ton of money on it, because every box of floppy disks sold in the country for like six months or whatever had a free copy of my game, and it became the number one best-selling game, and then of course Electronic Arts, you know, Paul wanted to just like, well, one submarine game made money, let's do another one, so we did another one called SSN21 Seawolf, and after that finished, I finally got to do my first person shooter I wanted to do. Um, and it was not a commercial success, but it was a technical success. I, I really liked that game. So it, then, Scar so, Scarab or how do you, how do you Scarab, say that one? Scarab. Scarab. Yeah. yeah it was a, a, a Egyptian themed first person shooter. It was really cool. And I don't want to talk about it because if I talk about it, this podcast will be 20 hours long. And I'm very <laughs> like, that's the only thing that could bring me back to programming again is 
to make to reboot that game i would love to reboot it uh, yeah but the problem is is um i did the math like even as inexpensively as possible like you know lone wolf doing all the work yourself it would still cost me half a million to a million dollars to reboot that game with no expectation of of actually making money on it and who's going to give me half a million or a million dollars to make the game and i'm not going to take it out of my own money out of my own pocket so it'll probably never get remade but i would love is that to re remake that it, game is it so expensive now is it just a contract out graphics or what causes yeah, the uh, just the programming uh animation art it's just it just it it's a lot like i i i mean so i actually did i did i hired a full-time employee i tried to reboot it once and i hired a full-time pro programmer i paid out of my own pocket so i already tried doing this once and it was you know a hard lesson learned that yeah so i know what it takes to write a video game and realize games today i mean they spend 100 billion 200 billion dollars on these games they're monstrous they have teams of hundreds of people working on them so to think that you could even make a game anybody wanted to play for only half a million dollars is kind of crazy to begin with but it just it costs a lot of money it's there's just no way around it what was the process like when you were first starting making games like how did you approach if you did uh, 688 attacks of all by your lonesome how, how did you approach that problem I don't know. I'm, I, so uh, there's two in, in software engineering, there's kind of like two discipline or two approaches. Uh, and one is called bottom up and other is called top down and top down is you look at this big vision. You, you step back and you see the big picture of everything. And then you work your way down from that big picture ultimately to the details. And I'm a bottom up guy. If you give me a problem, my brain immediately thinks of everything that needs to be done to get that. Like, I don't know if it's intuition or what. I just, so I build everything from the bottom up. And at any problem you give me, I, I, I break it into all these little in tiny, discrete, tiny tasks and problems. And ultimately, if you spend enough time on it, you'll end up to the big picture. And I'm, that's, that's just it. And there's, there's top down guys and there's there's bottom up guys and i'm a bottom up guy so i can't really entirely explain it but if you give me a problem my brain immediately sees the 400 little things that are going to have to be done to make that happen and then i just start i make a list of like here's the 400 things i got to do and i just sit there and check them off one at a time and eventually once they're all checked off it's done it works yeah and it seems like so you went from that early success with electronic arts and later in your career, you're also working on like a physics engine. Is that more software or is that, did you ever shift into kind of like where hardware and software meet or what kind of work did you do with like NVIDIA and the, the company that uh, NVIDIA bought the, the Aegis startup? Agia, yeah. So Agia. Um, the, I, I didn't, um, I, I have zero uh, uh, hardware um, understanding or expertise at all. Um, and then the thing with the GIA, it's, it's a, was a little bit, you no, know, it's a little bit weird, but it's, it's my history. So, um, uh, the game industry is very, uh, fickle and difficult. Um, it's very difficult to have an actual long-term career in the video game industry. And that was, I mean, everybody I worked with, I mean, you'd be lucky to, if you worked for the same company for three years, it was like, oh, I'm an old timer. I mean, this is <laughs> the way the industry was and maybe still is, but there was no, and I was, you know, married and raising children. So I needed, wanted stability in my life and I didn't want to be up and moving around. So it was very challenging having a game, a, a career in the video game industry. And I went from company to company to company um, as you, basically you, I remember the way I used to explain it is um, no one ever goes and goes, did you hear Tom Cruise lost his job? What do you mean? Tom Cruise is an actor. He he gave me a job, right? And the mm -hmm. the video game industry is like that. It's project oriented. So yeah. when people say, I got a job, no, you got hired to work on that game. And when that game is done, you ain't got a job no more. Maybe there'll mm -hmm. be another game. Maybe there won't. And most of the time there's not. And everybody I worked with, like all my peers, that was our lives. We'd get hired, maybe you're gonna work on, you know, Pro Busters nine thousand. And you'd work your butt off. You'd, they'd make you work obscene hours. 
create enormous stress. And then when the project was done, maybe, but most of the time, that was it. And you had to go find another job at another company. So that was my life. And the this uh, some dudes who were chip manufacturers, they created computer chips, got this idea that if we had a computer chip dedicated just to solving physics, there would be a market for that in video games. They were looking at graphics cards. That was the time when people were buying early, early, early GeForce cards from NVIDIA Corporation. They would buy these graphics cards, which could do 3D accelerated graphics. And um, they, the, the, the guys who started Aegea, they were like, well, if there could be a 3D graphics card, there could be a physics card. There could be a, a, a piece of hardware that just solves physics. And they raised $60 million in venture capital. <laughs> it was one of my, maybe my first experience ever with VC. Man, VC is weird as hell. So if you come <laughs> up with an idea, then you convince somebody to give you enormous amounts of money based on an idea. Like you have nothing. All you have is an idea. And um, then you have to spend the money. When a venture capital, capitals give you a bunch of money, they measure success by you spending that money. Not wow. you producing anything. If you don't spend it, you actually get penalized for not spending it. So they raised all <laughs> this money. I mean, they didn't get 60 million in their first round. There were multiple rounds of raise, but you know, they raised money. Well, as soon as they raised it, they had to hire people. So these guys got this idea and I just happened to live in St. Louis and I was a pretty well-known video game guy. So they call me and they tried to hire me. And I'm like, uh, the project I was... Oh, I remember what happened. Have you ever heard of the game Planetside? I, in the research, but yeah. I never played uh, it's, it. No. It's a massively multiplayer online game. It's a first-person shooter. And what distinguishes it from all the other games that are out there um, is it would host 2,000 simultaneous players, which 2, it still does today. And those are massive numbers. So if you think about pay, playing um, um, uh, shit, Fortnite or these other games, I mean... Those battle royals, what is the maximum number of players? It's like 30-ish, something like that, uh, yeah. Battlefield. And that's fun. I'm not criticizing those games at all. Those are tremendous fun games. But in, when you go into Planet Side, instead of being 30 people, there's 2,000. That experience in tanks, airplanes, it's not just guys running around guns. When you log into Planet Side, you'd be like, would you like to run a transport ship would you like to drive a tank would you like you pick your career profession in this so it's a military battlefield type simulator and you've got tanks and airplanes and there's guys like all they do is fly planes that even though there's other guys all they want to do is run around with a gun and shoot people and there's other guys all they and they specialize in that so planet side i did this game with electronic arts or no with sony and after the game was finished they um, decide. They told me my job was in uh, San Diego. So you, we're not firing you. We're not laying you off. But your job's now in San Diego. And I had a, a wife, four kids, and an ex-wife. And I was not going to pick up and move halfway across the country. And they'd given me, like, they, they were nice. They told me up front, this is coming. And at that exact same time, Agia Technologies called me and said, Hey, you want to work on our physics stuff? I was like, well, in between jobs, why not? So I went over there. I actually never did any any physics. Most of my, all the work that I did with Aegea was tools. So it, it, they hired different people to do the physics. Uh, guys are now really good friends of mine. I have had tremendous wonder. So I actually not wasn't a physics guy. There were, they hired people who did the physics. My job was to take their stuff and integrate it into game engines. It's so like the very first thing they I hired, they hired me. And within three months, my job was to get the physics integrated into Unreal Engine, which was something I was qualified to do. So that was really valuable. And I, after integrated into Unreal Engine, I integrated into other game engines and integrated it into all kinds of tool chains and wrote tools, integrated into video games. And then... Um, Ultimately, NVIDIA acquired Aegea, and I ended up getting to move over to NVIDIA, and uh, that was, you know, I had a, had a great career, and I was there 14 years, and um, it was a, it was a really positive experience. Do they do they use the physics cards now, or is there a different way to do that? 
So what happened was when uh, Ajia raised $60 million ultimately to make this physics thing, um, NVIDIA felt that was a threat to them, um, to their business, because, you know, so what NVIDIA did is NVIDIA spent a bunch of money proving that you could do physics on their graphics cards. And a lot of that was smoke and mirrors. They, they couldn't really do physics, but they made some cool demos that made people think. So NVIDIA viewed Agia as a threat to them. And uh, at the end of the day, um, the, the, the idea of buying a dedicated physics card, it didn't really pan out. And, you know, the VCs like, hey, you win some, you lose some. And they, you know, ready to, they shut the whole company down. And at that point, they were like, can we get any money out of this? So they approached NVIDIA. NVIDIA bought up, really just bought up the intellectual property and what was of value to NVIDIA was the physics software. They could care less about the hardware. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA knows hardware better than anybody. So NVIDIA's hardware, it was phenomenal, but there was a lot of intellectual property with the physics stuff itself. And that's what NVIDIA acquired. And that became PhysX and PhysX is ubiquitous across everywhere. Everybody uses it. It's, it's phenomenal. It's integrated in every game engine known to mankind. It's been used in hundreds and hundreds of video games. and the bulk of my 14 years at NVIDIA was working with the PhysX team, uh, who was mostly located in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. And um, Very cool. I integrated their physics into various game engines, game titles. So that was primarily uh, what I Like I had one time, they, they flew me to Los Angeles to put fur on a dog in Call of Duty. <laughs> like that was my like, what a <laughs> job. Like, yeah, I'm going to send you out to L.A. for two weeks. We want you to put fur on a dog. Just to okay. make it look natural? Well, they had this uh, uh, German Shepherd in, in the Call of Duty Ghosts. And this German Shepherd was, everywhere you went, this German Shepherd would f stay by your side. And it was beautifully done uh -huh. and well animated. Well, NVIDIA had this hair simulation technology. I didn't write, like I said, I never wrote the physics. Other people wrote the physics but I was good at integrating it. So I went out there and had to integrate the hair simulation. So on this particular video game, if you have the right graphics card and the right features and check the right option in the setting, this uh, 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 German Shepherd in the video game, I can't remember, it was something on the order of 150,000 individual strands of hair real time wow. simulated. And it was like, you practically had to get up close to the monitor to even see it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just enormous amount of, of time and energy and resources expended for something that, you know, you could, it was like, the game didn't play better because the damn dog had fur on it, right? Like, it didn't make the game any more fun. It was just a cool, cool visual. Yeah, awesome attention to detail. So over, I mean, it's a super successful career starting out with just that's an amazing little origin story there. What what would you attribute your success to, or if if you have uh, new coders or programmers coming out of high school or college and and want to have a similar career, what what advice would you give them? Yeah, so um, I mean, I've experienced my whole whole career, and I hope this stuff is still relevant because it's things I when asked that question, it's things I used to say a long time ago, and you know, times change, but I think it's a lot of it's still relevant. So even when I went to, to college, I experienced this. Um, there's, there's two different types of computer programmers. There's people who have treated as an art that, 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 that they love it. Like they find joy in program, like programming a computer genuinely makes them happy and feel good. And then there's other people who just treat it as a job. It's an engineering discipline. You learn it, you do it, it's mechanical and rote, and it's not. There's not a lot of creativity in it. It's just a freaking job. And I would say, you know, I can't give you exact percentages, but most people are in that category. Um, the the, and you've heard the stories in the video game industry of what I found and when I went into. So when I graduated college, I, I'm sorry, I didn't ever graduate. I never finished my college degree, but. Um, I had to drop out because I didn't have money. And um, my friends who graduated, who had enough money to finish, they were going out and getting jobs at Boeing and, you know, these big defense contractors, um, really 
good high paying jobs and they would go in and and do do really well at that uh i didn't have that opportunity i had i had to like send a letter to electronic arts saying please hire you know please see this i was programming the computer for fun like when i would interview young people i would say the type of questions i would ask them would be like um what do you program for fun and if their if their response was fun <laughs> like program without someone paying me like then i'm like no go away i'm not going to hire you in other words if you are not already teaching yourself how to program a computer by the age of 14 and writing your own video games just give it up like if that's not in your dna if you do not just love the joy of coding like i'm not saying don't go to college because you should go to college there's a lot to learn there uh, and but virtually everyone i know of in the video game industry across the board most of them never went to college or never graduated they're all self-taught they started programming when they're 12 13 14 years old if you want to get in the video game industry the only way to get a video game industry is to write a video game like literally you can't like you don't go to college get a four-year degree and say please hire me no you have to be writing video games on your own so it's it's about being you have to love programming you have to be really good at it you have to be self-motivated self-directed and you need to be programming all the time for yourself and uh that's I think that's still true today, even as it was. So there are really two different mental models. So you can have a very good career as a, just a straight up engineer doing the job, but this creativity and self-motivation is what's required to be in the video game industry and to be successful in a, lot, in a lot of aspects of life. And why I'm really good at programming computers, I couldn't tell you. I'm, I don't know why, it just comes to me naturally and uh i don't know it's like i i'm my whole career i've never been the smartest person and let me tell you go to work for nvidia if you want to feel dumb like <laughs> i don't care how many phds you have go to nvidia and see how dumb you feel it is insane like it, it is incredibly hard to get a job at nvidia they mostly hire phds the interview process is really difficult i was the only reason i got a job at nvidia is because i got swept up with this acquisition of this other company like there's no way in a billion years i would have gotten interviewed at nvidia and they would have hired me no college degree i'm not that smart but being smart isn't enough right like my thing is i program really really fast so there might be a guy here who's got you know three phds and he's so much smarter than me i can't even understand what he's talking about but i can program about 50 times faster than he can and it'll have no bugs and that's just some weird skill i fell into so i'm actually not super smart but i'm really good at programming a computer and i do it really fast and it's really um well done that programming has there's different parts to to programming uh there's there's design there's implementation there's debugging and there's some people who are only good at some of those things but not all of them and i'm good at all of them and really good at it so yeah well i'm sure doing it in your off time you know as a hobby and just because you enjoyed it i'm sure that played a huge role like well they say the whole ten thousand ten thousand hours things you got to that number i think earlier than than many many others yeah and and then like i said it, it, back to you know what advice you know, if you are not like don't just teach yourself like like don't you like i'm gonna go to college to learn how to program a computer i'm like what do you go to college to learn I'm like just do it like <laughs> no when i went yeah there's when i went to college i knew more than every single professor that was there like that i remember at this one time i went up to a professor and i asked him a question and about halfway through the question i realized he has no idea what i'm talking about <laughs> like just teach yourself it's it's all out there and now you know now we've got chat gpt which is you know it's an incredible resource for you just ask it a question and even though i'm only programming you know on a little personal hobby projects i've been using chat gpt more just like if i was working would this help me and uh it's it's really powerful tool do you right use now, it just as a base kind of a base layer and then work from there no not at all do you know what stack exchange or stack overflow is 
I've seen it. I've never used it. I'm familiar so with it. Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow is, I don't know, maybe I'm not describing it well, but there's there are these places where programmers can ask questions to other programmers. So you go to Stack Exchange, you're like, I don't know how to solve this problem. So you go to Stack Exchange, and some programmer somewhere on the planet has solved that problem, or you ask the question. Um, that has been traditionally for quite a while now how computer programmers learn new things. They go to Stack Overflow. But the thing is, those things are really hostile. You ask a question, and instead of a guy going, oh, let me help you with that. Let me patiently explain. No, like, you freaking idiot. I can't believe you should be banned. I mean, it's the most hostile, unpleasant environment. Like, it's really, really toxic. You guys, chat, G, chat BT will never say, oh, you're an idiot for asking that question. <laughs> I know that's the number one thing about chat GPT, isn't that it's, it gives, it's that it's patient, that it's not an asshole. So I used to go to Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange, even though they were unpleasant, because that's where the answers are. Now I just mm -hmm. go ask chat GPT. So I still do all my own programming. Chat GPT doesn't do any programming for me per se, but if I'm like, oh, how do you do a custom hash index lookup? I got chat GPT. He goes, here's how you do a custom hash lookup. And I'm like, wow. oh, okay. And and that's all I need. And I used to go to Stack Overflow to answer those kinds of questions. Um, it I don't see it like I have one of the things when I think chat GPT is fine for junior programmer type stuff. I think that for beginners, it's an unbelievably unbelievable learning resource. I've heard lots of anecdotes about people who don't even know how to program a computer, who ChatGPT has written programs. But flip this on the other side. I'm an expert computer programmer. Sorry, ChatGPT. I know a lot more than you do. And <laughs> I have asked ChatGPT and Bard, by the way, I AB'd them. And um, when I'm asking it to write a program, I'm not asking it something I don't already know the answer. Okay, so I yeah. ask it something I already know the answer to, and it has never once given me an answer that was even close to what I would have written myself. And my typical interaction with ChatGPT would be like, write a function that does the following, and it goes, Poof. I'm like, yeah, that would work, but it's slow as shit. Why don't you use a table lookup? Oh, thank you for that suggestion, John. Here it is with a table lookup. I'm like, yeah, you realize that that table is getting reinitialized every single time. Oh, you're right, John, let me fix that. That's how my experience goes. I ask it something I already know how to do, and it doesn't do a very good job. And after I keep prodding it and prompting it, it eventually gives a good result. Um, and I think that people who are using ChatGPT who do not have the depth of knowledge that I have, they're thrilled that it's giving back anything that works. They don't realize yeah. that it could have done a whole lot better um, so my experience is chat GPT actually, it has like, if I ask it to do something, I already know the answer to, I can coax it to produce something that's it's impressive. Bard just flat out gives wrong answers. It's hysterical. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on with Bard and Google, but that thing struggling. is, it's got some serious, serious way to go, but they right, need now, right now it's just a tool that enhances productivity. Um, but yeah, it, it, you know, that's today, five years from now, we may all be out of a job. I don't know. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see if they hire people like you just to kind of coach it up and if it can learn from, you know, the experts and who, who knows what yeah, it's going to look like. I don't like. know either. I think maybe it already learned. Like when I did that, maybe it yeah. learned it and, and retained that knowledge or it was just temporary during our session. But ultimately, that's the way these AIs are going to work. They're going to learn from us. I mean, everything they know, they learn from us to begin with. But they're going to get smarter by us. The more we interact with these AIs, the smarter they're going to get. It's awesome. And John, I wanted to wanted to end it on this this last question about talking about the future and and what we're going to see. And uh, more and more now, I'm seeing virtual reality or whatever Apple has as well, whatever they want to call it, all the the 3D goggles, do you see gaming uh, tr shifting into that role in anytime soon or are traditional game consoles going to stick around for a while? 
I don't know, I mean, it's already a big market for the virtual reality games now, so it's just another niche. Like, I, I got the um, MetaQuest 2, I bought that and uh, bought a lot of games for it and let the kids play the games on it, and it's clearly, there's an ecosystem there, people enjoy that kind of play, um, so I don't see it as a, I just think that's a different style of play, I think there's a market there, but uh, console games aren't going anywhere, they're going to be here for very long time people enjoy that experience and for good reason so i i don't think mean, people are buying freaking 85 inch televisions they want to <laughs> project their giant sports game or, or whatever on it so no i think that i think that there's it's a niche i don't know if you've played MetaQuest at all but i mean it's pretty cool it's cool yeah that's what i'm thinking i'm wondering if that's going to be if, if that's all we're going to have if we even need the 85 inch tvs here in the next five years or if everyone's going to be wearing their goggles I think it's just going to be mix and match. I think there's multiple markets. And then I'm a little jaded because, you know, you know, the first virtual reality goggles came out in like 1995 or something. I've seen, I've seen this. We've all seen it over every few years. They come out with another set of virtual reality thing. There's a bunch of hype and then it all sort of, I mean, look what happened with Facebook. I mean, they rebranded the company as Metaverse. They threw everything in the kitchen sink. We're going to be the Metaverse. And they've pretty much, that whole thing has all collapsed on them. So is there a market for VR goggles? Absolutely. But I don't think anyone has a monopoly on that space. Um, and I think, yeah, I don't know. That's yeah, it's it really right now. Right now it's niche. Like, you know, it's a, sort of the same thing. Like I bought... Um, I bought a Nintendo Switch, um, and you're like, to me, that's a fair analogy. Like, a Nintendo Switch is a certain style of gaming, and for the people who love that type of gaming, but, you know, nobody, nobody's playing the latest, you know, Battlefield Red Dead Redemption on a, on a Switch. Like, that's on their big-ass monster consoles. So gaming is stratified into these different styles of play and genres, and they... I don't think anybody's got a monopoly. I don't think console games are going anywhere. VR games aren't going anywhere. Mobile gaming isn't going anywhere. They all have their own piece of the pie. Yeah, it is interesting. And you talk about the Switch on the submarine. I swear every person on a submarine owns a Switch. That's like the the console of choice. It's, uh, that's it's cool. a game changer. You know that's an <laughs> NVIDIA-made product, don't you? No. So Not everybody that's... knows that. Yeah. No, uh, well, I, so the actual hardware, the physical hardware, that's NVIDIA. That's NVIDIA chips. NVIDIA makes it. Uh, so it's you know it's a Nintendo console, but um, the the I don't I don't should get into that anecdote. But I was involved with that decision, and um, yeah, I, I won't get into the details of that. But yeah, Nintendo uh, worked with NVIDIA, so not everybody knows that Nintendo Switch is actually an NVIDIA product. So you have a little bit of you little piece of uh of the switch. You you can see every switch you see out in the open that you you were a part of that of oh, making no, that thing. God, That's no. pretty cool. No, like I said, I have nothing to do with hardware. No, I'm a software <laughs> guy. I uh we, we uh we were able to port a bunch of AAA game titles um as a result of that contract, and that was a project I worked on at Nvidia. Um, that was the coolest technical accomplishment of my career. Um, was we wrote a Nintendo Wii emulator for the ARM processor, me and about five other guys, and uh, it was a pretty pretty cool technical accomplishment. So, so you could use all the like, AAA is like the biggest blockbuster games. Yeah, I'm talking and, about like the biggest ones. Yeah, and what was on the Wii, you could then just they could use on their on their Switch because the Switch uses the ARM. Uh, they did their own thing. We did it. NVIDIA had a product called the NVIDIA Shield, which oh. they were putting a lot behind, and it was kind of their own console. It was NVIDIA's, and 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 the 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 um, I'm, the reason I'm hemming on, I make sure I don't get into violating any NDA stuff here. So, oh yeah, so, uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm just I'm the one that's telling the story. I just be so. NVIDIA wanted. Of course, they wanted their console to be a commercial success. Nobody makes a product and doesn't want it to be. But Jensen's impetus was he wanted the experience of creating the entire life cycle of a product for the company as a learning experience as well. So previously, NVIDIA made computer cards. They don't make the computer. They just make the card you put in the computer, right? We make computer chips. We never built the entire 
packaging to the joystick to the everything and nvidia wanted to have that experience and they learned a lot there's a lot of value so they created this nvidia shield gaming console it was not a commercial success uh, but one of the projects I got assigned to was to port all of these old Nintendo games over to that new console because we wanted we wanted to have you know great content for our gaming yeah. console. So that was a cool project. Definitely, those are those are always my favorite too, the old Nintendo ones. Yeah. But, uh, well, John, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I know uh, I, I love talking to Bitcoiners, and then also coding and software is just fascinating. And I, I can't wait to see your project with. Uh, the Bitcoin timeline and yeah. the cold versus hot movement and all that. So it's, it's really cool stuff. Well, you seem like a really, really nice guy. I wish you the best of luck on your uh, podcast. Uh, you are, you're a really good interviewer. You have a good personality, a good demeanor. And I can't thank you enough for your service to our country. I, I, one of my big regrets in life is I did not serve in the military. I wish I had, um, but um, my son did. And, and I, I think what you what you did there was fantastic. Well, I really appreciate that, John. And uh, if you're ever in Austin, I, I owe you a big steak dinner. But well, sounds fantastic. Uh, I'm sure I'll end up there. <laughs> well, enjoy enjoy retirement. All right, See take you. care, Mike. Thank you for listening to the Mike White Podcast. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Mike White Pod, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Y'all have a great day.